Most of the NFT projects that are going on right now, I would say 99% of them are failing right now. What is the next step and how can you share something with your audience that makes sense for your business? Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Joe Polizzi, author of Content Inc. and founder of The Tilt, a media site focused on helping content creators become content entrepreneurs. He's also host of the Content Inc. podcast and co-host of the This Old Marketing podcast. Joe, welcome to my new show, Crypto Business. You've been a regular guest on my other show many times, but this is your first time on this show. How are you doing today, man? I'm absolutely fantastic. It's an honor to be on your new podcast. Of course, I'm already a fan. So, well, and of course, I knew you were going to go this direction just because you're smart. I mean, we're we're talking about crypto. What are you, what are you going to do? But this is exciting and we've done what seven, eight podcasts together, but we actually are doing this through video and we're, we're yeah. into the new age here. Well, for those that are listening to the podcast, there is a video over on our YouTube channel. So Joe, there's going to be people that are going to listen to this episode. They're not going to know who Joe Polizzi is. They're not going to know necessarily a bit of your story. So why don't you tell us um, ultimately how you got into NFTs, but start wherever you, it makes the most amount of sense for you to start. Sure. Yeah. I mean, let me, it, it's hard not to go back to when you and I both started our businesses, Michael. I mean, you were starting social media marketing world, social media examiner. I was starting um, content marketing Institute. This is 2007. And if you were to, to put a, a marker on it, you'd say this was web 1.5, you know, going into web two, Facebook really wasn't a thing yet. Twitter just came out. And I guess I was blessed because we really focused on building an audience of email subscribers. We did it on a blogging platform, which was sort of the, the first scalable model that we had becoming media professionals and doing this thing. And then, you know, we were blessed by the Facebooks, the Twitters and the YouTubes to spread that message. But we always had the opportunity to build that first party audience. And of course, fast forward to, to 2016, uh, you know, we had Content Marketing Institute, Content Marketing World, the largest event in content marketing, built this you know, 200,000 subscribers around it. And we had an amazing exit uh, sold to UBM, now Informa. And, you know, I was out of the business then. And as you know, I'm like, oh, this is retirement. I, I, I was writing a novel called The Will to Die. It did fairly well. And then lo and behold, what happens is COVID and everything changes. Now, I probably should mention that in 2017, I went down the crypto rabbit hole. I it was my first purchase of Bitcoin. Uh, 2018, I got into Ethereum. I love the idea. By the way, you're pretty early. I'm jealous of that, by the way. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. You and I, you know, we listen to all the crypto podcasts out there and I feel late. Yeah. I really feel late. I felt late at the time. And honestly, Mike, I still feel late. Right. I'm still learning. I mean, we're, we're training ourselves as we go. But I love the idea of decentralized finance. I'm like, wow, this is really a thing. Uh, and so I'm testing it and, I'm, and then starting to get more and more into it. And 2020 comes along. And that's when everything changes for me, both personally and, and career wise. My book launch party for The Will to Die was March 8th, 2020. And if you, if everyone sort of knows March yeah, of 2020. Yeah, and like March 11th or 12th, the whole world shut down, right. right? Well, you know, because you had social media marketing world like right before that. Yeah, the everyone third, was fourth, starting and fifth. to talk about yeah. this thing. Yeah, yeah. so we, we knew. Yeah. Um, so I had the book launch party and literally the next day, everything shut down. And I had, um, you know, the plans were to keep writing as it become, become a novel, write part two, whatever the case is. But I, I, I don't know if I got bored or I started to really see what was happening with social tokens, with NFTs, with crypto from a content creation standpoint. So this is when this is why I talked to you about kind of starting in 2007, 2008 with Web 1.5 or whatever you want to call it, because at that time, us as media professionals, we created a business, we uh, built an audience, but we were the ones that had all the value. We retained all the value. And then you get into web two and I'm so happy I didn't start in 13 or 14 or 15 on rented platforms because I would have had my subscriber. I wouldn't have had control over those subscribers. I would have had to figure out, well, how do I take all that value that I've given to Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and then move that over to something proprietary that I have control over like an email list, like a own membership site or whatever the case is. So I'm thinking, oh, okay. 
uh, we're getting in. Now, if we go back to, to 2020 and the idea of the token, I'm like, this could really be something for a content creator's business model. This could be something where, all right, if you believe that centralized platforms won in the late teens and early 20s, maybe now creators and their audience can both win. So if you think that the token is sort of the unit of measure for the internet, which is what I'm coming to believe, if it is the unit, unit of measure, then maybe when I create something, I can work with my audience. They can own a little piece of this thing. They can help me co-create this thing. And that got to basically October 2020. And that's when I said, all right, I'm changing everything. I'm coming out of retirement. I'm going to launch the tilt which is basically a newsletter for content creators. And if we're going to do this, I've, you know, I've got to learn how this works. And we launched our own social token then March of 2021 after that tilt coin on the rally.io network, because I'm fascinated by the business model. I'm like, okay, could this really be a thing? So, you know, you, you started the show talking about NFTs, but my first jump into the token, if you will, was with a social token or a creator coin or a community token, whatever you want to call it. And that's by the way, we should mention well. we should mention that Joe was on the social media marketing podcast specifically talking about his social token. And I will get that uh, link for everybody sure. in just a few minutes, but you can keep going with this. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, we don't have to go over the whole idea, but but there's if you're thinking about fungible tokens, which, which is a social token like Tiltcoin, or you get into non-fungible tokens, which we'll talk about NFTs, I'm thinking, okay, well, we've got to get into it all. We've got to test it all. So, you know, it started with the social token at Tiltcoin and integrated that into our entire business model. And right now, I believe the market cap of Tilt, and, and by the way, not, you know, we're not, this is not the ICO market of 2017. I'm not pumping Tiltcoin or anything. It's an access-based token. It's a membership-based token. But the whole market cap, if you were to look on the Rally Network, is about $5 million for that token. It's wow. done. It's done. I know it's done fairly, fairly well. So if you think about, you know, we we were you and I were trying to build scale. So we had to have so many email subscribers in 10 and 11 and 12 and whatnot. But now we've got 1,600 coin holders for Tiltcoin. And I really do believe in the, you know, the true true hundred fan model of Kellen, Kevin Kelly. If you look at, uh, listen to what Lee Jin talks about, she says sort of like a thousand true fans where you can get a smaller number of people. Yeah, she says a hundred true fans. You don't need a thousand, you need a hundred. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think there's, you know, you're whatever you want to, a hundred, right. 500, a thousand, whatever right. it is, Right. you don't need a large audience to scale. And that's what we're educating against, right? You and I, I mean, you've, you're in the social media area all the time when, when people are saying, oh, I got to get a large audience on YouTube or Twitch or Instagram. You have to have that scale because the business model of those centralized uh, platforms, they call for that, especially for advertising. But what if today that's not necessary? And I really believe that's where the token comes in. So if you could look at social tokens, we're doing fairly well with a thousand coin holders for Tiltcoin. Or if you look at a lot of these NFT projects, there's a hundred, 500, a thousand. So that's where you get in. And I guess it goes back to, I really believe now full circle, we launched the business. Great. We had a wonderful community. And I, I talked to that community all the time, even though we sold and they said, great, we learned a lot from you, Joe, but they didn't have any piece of that. You know, they didn't see that thing grow. They didn't necessarily co-create with us on that. But now today, as we move past whatever this is today, is it Web 2.3, 2.5? You know, we're not, we're just getting into Web 3.0. Now the audience can actually create and have a little piece of that value. So you get into social tokens and now you get into NFTs. And folks, it was episode 493, uh, socialmediaexaminer.com slash 493 published on a January the 13th called Social Tokens, What Businesses Need to Know. So so Joe, um, continue with your story. Sure. You know, obviously have been successful with social tokens and then you decided that you were gonna do something else. And maybe this is a, a time to talk about how sure. you got inspired by our friend Gary Vee. Yeah, absolutely. So I probably listened to Gary on, I think it was the Kevin Rose podcast uh, which was Mar March, April, May, what, whatever it was of 2021. And he was talking about V friends. And I, I love Gary. I love Gary's hustle. I don't necessarily agree with everything he says, but 
man, can that that man uh, he can do a lot and has done a lot and added a lot for our industry. So thankfully, and I'm like, okay, V friends, is this a, what is this thing? Yeah, and I, I didn't go get and, it either. <laughs> and yeah, and I, exactly. I go and look at it. And I wish I would have believed more in it when, when Gary was minting all these things because I was there on the mint site when Gary's, and for those people that don't know it, be friends, it's an NFT collection of 10,255, I think, of his original art plus a- exclusive access to certain things with and around Gary. So the first thing is the 10,225, they get access to VCon, which will be an event for with Gary's event for 22, 23. 23, 24. So great. That's one part of it. And then if you get special NFTs as part of that, you might get to go to a garage sale with Gary or you get courtside seats with Gary, whatever the case is. So if you look right now, I believe the last I checked the the floor for uh, VFriends NFTs is probably around 12.5. So you're you're talking around 40,000 US dollars right now if you just wanted to buy the minimum which is crazy nuts. Yeah, and just real quick statistics. Um, according to OpenSea, uh, the V Friends is in the top five of all social tokens on OpenSea. So you've got you've got Board Ape, you've got uh, what's the other one? Uh, CryptoPunks. CryptoPunks, and then down there at number five is Gary Vaynerchuk with yeah. his V Friends. So, and like you, I didn't understand it at all. I went there and I saw I could have gotten these things at a half of ETH. I had no idea what the heck they were. But anyway, so yeah. keep going with the story. Oh, no, I, re- I remember sitting on the Gift Goat Mint page, like to get one. And Gift Goat is the NFT yeah. where every month they'll send you something in the mail. And I'm like, oh man, it's, it's like 0.5 ETH. I'm like, I should pick one up. Well, now the thing's like 50 ETH. It's cra- it's cra- it's crazy. Anyways, yeah. we don't. There there are some interesting things going on, but that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is I thought that this idea of an NFT or what I, for events, I call it a never ending ticket. I believe that NFTs and ticket ticketing are going to be interspersed and changed forever as we know it. And I think this idea for specifically events and NFTs is something that I wanted to look at and I wanted to test the waters. And so besides from that moment on, you know, when I was listening to that podcast in early 21, Mike, and then on, of course, I got into some Crypto Dads NFTs. I got into uh, Crypto Toads. Uh, you know, I, I got into Crypto Punks really early, a little bit earlier than than V Friends. So lucky to get a couple of those. But then I'm thinking, what's the business application? I mean, this is why you created the show, right? What's the business application for something like an NFT? And I said, okay, well, if we're going to do this, let's create our own, what I call a never ending ticket. So uh, your and my friend, Brian Clark, we got together and said, okay, we're going to do an event. So which by the way, you know, who launches an event in the middle of a pandemic? I do apparently. So we launched creator. As do I. (laughs) Exactly. We're just crazy. Launch CEX, Creator Economy Expo. It'll be May 2nd through 4th in, in Arizona, basically for content creators, the same target for, for Tilt. And we're like, okay, we're going to do an in-person event for 500. Can we do an NFT along with this? And I wanted to do the never-ending ticket concept. I've been talking about it on my blog and, and on my podcast for a long time saying, I this is a thing. Um, never-ending tickets, it's going to be part of every event going forward but not a lot of people besides Gary were doing it. I'm like, okay, well, let's go ahead and try that. So we launched in December. Okay, I want to pause you right there because we're going to come back to this story in just a minute, okay? Okay. So, um, because this next question is really important. We're going to get back to more about what you're doing with this upcoming event and everything. But there are some people listening right now, probably the majority of people listening right now, that are like, I don't understand why I should ever consider using an NFT for my business. Sure. I want you to make the business case as to why someone who's listening right now, whether they be a creator, whether they be a business owner, or whether they work in marketing for a business, why should they consider sure. NFTs? Well, first of all, NFTs is the tech. So there's a lot of business questions that you have to answer beforehand. For example, if you said you wanted to start a media company, you're not going to run to NFTs. The first thing you want to do is build an audience or a community because who's going to buy the NFTs? Now, you and I have seen some of these NFTs start off and you'll see a Discord community get together really quickly and get big fast. But those are very rare. 
most of the NFT projects that are going on right now, I would say 99% of them are failing right now because they don't have an audience ahead of time. So the first thing is, is how does this fit into your business strategy? What value are you going to deliver to your audience? And if it's something that you can find some value, some access, some membership program, are you going to then create digital scarcity? And that's what we're talking about. An NFT, non-fungible token, it's a scarce digital good, obviously out in the metaverse, if you want to call it that, that you can create that gives some ownership to your audience. So you have to figure out, okay, what is that benefit that you want to give to your audience? So if you look at like Pool Suite is out there, they're doing something with their NFTs where if you get one of their 7,000 or something NFTs, you get... You, you can put it on your phone and your NFT and you can get into one of whatever swanky clubs all across the United States and the world. And that's sort of their membership access. Okay. So think membership. Is this something where you want to create a cool membership club where people can get access to certain things that nobody else can? Well, maybe that's an NFT. Why would you do an NFT versus a regular program? Because you're giving ownership to your audience. That audience member who bought that NFT from you, whatever the case is, they can then go to a secondary market, a la OpenSea, and they can sell that to somebody else. So they actually have market value with them. That's what I love about it because then they're probably more willing to talk about your stuff too because the more that they help grow your thing, the more that it's helping them. And that's why you've seen that with Gary Vee, right? You've just got fanatics, super fans that are spreading this thing all around because the more they talk about it, the more it's helping them because they have these NFTs. Well, and this is really important for people to process in their mind. Gary sold all of his NFTs for between a half of an ETH and I think three ETH, if I'm not mistaken. Something like that. And he makes more money on the secondary market. He makes, he's been on record to say he makes over a million dollars a day in people trading this on OpenSea. Okay. So that's 300 million plus dollars that he's making a year just on the trading of this of this resource, which is way more money than the actual minting in the first place, right? So when you as a business wrap your head around the economics of of a limited supply becoming something that's in high demand and people trading that supply and you always, because of the smart contract, earning money on that, the real opportunity is the upside of what can happen after the minting. Don't you agree? Exactly. No, I totally agree with that. Absolutely. And we'll talk about some of our failures as well in the future, because I would have probably done some things differently with that. But if you go back to the business model, this is where it's really important because please have a business strategy before you just go launching into anything and look at what's going on. So look at what's going on in in music. I think Nas just released uh, his uh, NFT collection where you get a percentage of his royalties for his upcoming album. So that's something that you might. So so what value can you deliver to your audience? So I think you're going to see a lot of rewards programs, a lot of loyalty programs go into that. Um, but I love the whole business model of access. And that's what we, we talk about never ending tickets. That's what you're talking about with V friends. We're not talking about NFTs as a beautiful uh, or not, or subjective piece of art. Art was the first, that was the first go around for NFTs, right? That's how NFTs got popular. And you got crypto punks, which is based or me bits or something like that. That is just art. And that's fine. And there's nothing wrong with that. But again, that was just the start. What is the next step and how can you share something with your audience that makes sense for your business? So, and I'll give you a quick, um, do you think about it from a content creator standpoint, Mike? Because there's there's basically eight different ways a content creator can drive revenue. Well, you can drive through advertising sponsorship, through affiliate programs, through an event like we run, you could sell products and services and merch and whatever. Well, you could overlay that with an NFT. It's just different kinds of tech. It's just that you're giving a little bit of ownership back to the community. So you could sell sponsorships and advertising as NFTs if you wanted to. You could set access, set access to your conference and event through an NFT if you want to. You could have partner relationships set up through NFT programs if you wish to do that. Now, let's just put it all out there, Mike. You and I are learning. Like, we're all learning. This is so early. Like, I'm trying to put this into internet age. This is probably 95 or 96. So think about when there was nothing, when there was nothing. I think it's more like 99 personally, but still. That's okay. Yeah. First inning, getting out of the dugout, whatever, right? You're definitely not into the second and third inning yet, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, you're you're okay. So at least in '99, Netscape browser was probably still a thing, right? So we're we're still we're in the same we're in the same ballpark. 
But if you're going to go forward, I think experimentation at this point is fine. But again, don't do it just because, oh, I want to try this new tech. Right. Do it because it makes sense for your business. So let's talk about what you did then. So you started this event called CEX, which stands for what? Content Expo? Creator Economy Expo. Oh, Creator Economy Expo. Okay. Yeah. So tell us about what you did with this never ending ticket concept. Uh, so full disclosure, I'm an owner of one of those. Um, this is not financial advice, but you know, go ahead and explain what the vision was, what you did, all that fun stuff so people can wrap their head around it. Exactly. So basically back to, I wanted to give this a shot. What if we gave attendees that wanted to come to CEX, what if we gave them a little bit more? So we created this idea of CEX never ending tickets. There's just 100 of them. Each one has an individually designed, uh, piece of art, which I love. It's all a creator. You get a podcaster. Or you got, I forgot which one you got, Mike. I'm you a podcaster. A, yeah. You got a podcaster. So it's great. You got the triple. You don't know threat. what you get, by the way, when you're buying it. So just for the record, you don't so. know what you get at this point. You don't know what you get because we're yeah. in the minting process and we're not, yeah. I mean, you right. can get them on open sea right. in the secondary market, but nobody's selling them yet. Right, right. So we, you get that, but each one that you get, it gets never, you know, never ending admission, virtual perpetual admission into CEX and event, as long as we do it. We do one event a year, two events a year. If we do them wherever we do them, you will always get a tick complimentary ticket as part of this access, this never ending ticket that you have. You will also get access to every VIP party that you go to. Okay, so that's standard, Mike. So what are some other things? So we've got, I don't know, 30 or 35 special NFTs out of this that'll, that will most of them haven't even minted yet as we talk about this, where you could get one that you introduce somebody from the main stage of every CEX if you get that one. There's eight, I think, backstage passes where you get to meet our keynote, celebrity keynote, whichever one we have and meet them, meet and greet on the backstage. So these are special ones that we haven't gotten to yet in the minting process. And how much are you selling these for? So right now the the minting free fee, and I want to talk about this because I think this is where we made a mistake, is 0.75 ETH. So 0.75 ETH in US dollars as we talk about this right For now. For only a certain number, then it goes up, right? So the way we have it is the first 50 are 0.75, the next 25 are at one, and the next 25 are at 1.25. Okay, Which, so before we get into what, what you learned about this, sure. um, what was your thinking? Why did you decide to do this in the first place with this a skewing price uh, raising kind of thing? And by the way, you've also set it up so you can only buy one. That's an important yeah. thing too. Set it up to buy one. I wanted all, I didn't want people to you get didn't them want and people then start to... trading them. Yeah, I wanted exactly. this to go to our audience. Right. And I thought that, oh, you know, get get them while they're cheaper. You know, we'll yeah. for first early birds to, yeah. to that we'll give them the best price and then we'll go up from there. And that's basically still the idea as we go. Now um, some people are wondering, okay, so um it's 0.75 ETH. And when you started the process, Ethereum was at like 4,500 bucks, uh, Ethereum That's right. or, or Ether. And now it's at about 3000, right? So it's gone down quite a bit. Um, Obviously, you must have known that that's a highly volatile asset when you were when you were kind of planning this thing. But um, what was the the what what was the business idea behind doing this? Was the idea to fund your operating costs? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So, so you're probably saying, okay, why? If I had to do it over, one thing I would do is I probably launch the event first and have like I would launch if you were doing it because you're in what year ten or something of social media marketing world. I would say, no, this is great. You can yeah. launch this VIP. You have the audience. They know this is wonderful. We don't even have a product yet. We don't even have an event. So right. I, I, I probably would have. Oh, have you waited. launched you launched the token before you launched the actual events is what I'm hearing you yeah, say. We had the audience, so the audience is fine. We didn't make that mistake, but I probably would have put off on the timing of launching that at, at this point because there, I'm trying to sell so many things at one time. So right. if you have something already, great, then you could, you could use this never-ending ticket concept, but it's a little bit more difficult because basically we had to educate on this is what CEX is. Then we had to educate on the fact that, and here's the downside, and this is where a business owner has to really look at their audience. I would say when we started this process, maybe 1%, probably less than that, Mike, of our audience had a digital wallet, had a MetaMask account. So this is, by the way, if you look at what Gary V did, this is where he was so smart because for months in advance, he was doing tutorials with his audience about how to get 
a MetaMask account. He was dropping NFTs to people all the time to get them used to it so that when he launched vFriends, everybody was all set up. Well, when we launched uh, this, uh, the first week of December of 2021, we were like, great. Well, we had the people that had the wallets and understood it. They bought right away, but most of our audience didn't have a wallet yet. So I would have spent more time educating and making sure this is why you'd want to do it. This makes sense. Let's help you get set up. And that's been actually most of our sales have been getting people set up with a digital wallet, working them through. So it's it's very it's a very, very time consuming process where yeah, if you're we not should crypto pause here native, for a second. If you're not yeah. crypto native, you're gonna have to go through this yourself. Yeah. And this is really important because the fact is that most people are used to paying by credit card for an event to access to an event. Yeah. And the concept of buying a never ending ticket, um, but you can't use a credit card. Uh, okay, what do I use? Uh, you have to you have to first go out and you have to buy Ethereum, which means you got to set up an account on something like Coinbase. Then you got to go set up an account on this MetaMask thing. Then you got to know how to connect the whole thing together. And then where does your ticket go? You know, it's nowhere. <laughs> you know, it's like you have to go over to EtherScan or OpenSea to be able to see it, right? And it's like. It's like, uh, 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 right. And these are the, these are all barriers to having an audience embrace, um, something like this that eventually will be no longer an issue. But today in the near, for the, for the short, for the next year, at least, this is going to be a serious barrier for a lot of people selling these things well, to an audience that does not understand this. Don't you agree? Exactly. This is so critical and it's, it's really important. So one of the, I want to go back to social tokens for one second because it, it's important. The reason why we went with Rally, so a lot of people might not like Rally.io because it's a little bit of cent centralization. It's sort of your own social token community, but it's so easy to sign up. As you know, Mike, you can go ahead, you sign up with your email and somebody can send you a, a social token, a creator coin immediately done. That's all you need is an email address and you need to know what your little code or username is. Done. Well, with an NFT, it's not that simple. You have to go yeah. through multiple steps. And you know what? And you know this. When you first get started and you try to figure out how to buy your first NFT, it, it is scary. Because you know what? There's no bank to back you, back you up. If you send it to the wrong address, if you mint it wrong, if you do a whole number of things, it's gone. Like you'll never get it back. There's yeah, no then you have to explain the gas, you have to you. explain gas fees to people too, right? I mean, it's like exactly. it's like there's all these little aspects to it that are um, that are barriers to you. Yeah. You were, you probably had hopes that this was going to sell out instantly. Is my guess, right? I had hopes of that. Now looking back, I I totally understand why because our audience isn't Gary Vee's audience. Yeah, our audience are content creators. Generally, they're between the ages of 35 to 50. Yeah. They've been listening to me talk on my podcast about Web3, about DAOs, about Bitcoin and whatever, but they're still feeling it out. Right. And maybe they've gotten a wallet, but they haven't taken. I, I would say that maybe uh, half a percent even has an NFT of any kind right now. Very, very small audience. So I've got to do all this education moving so forward. As so as of today, January 19th, as we're recording this, and this is going to come out a little bit later, sure. what are you about a fifth of the way through your yeah, sales? Yeah, so we, I think we're, tw we sold 23. Okay, so, so you're almost a quarter mistaken. of the way through. Okay. Yeah, so we're getting there. And, and I would imagine as you get closer to the conference, there'll be a lot more interest in this, I would imagine, right? Well, especially as the price of the event goes up. So at the end, so so pretty soon the price will go to $7.95, then to $9.95. And then you start right. adding the numbers together. You're like, wow, this is a really good value just for one year. Right. But right now you're like, okay, what is this event? Is this even going to happen? And I'll, I'll tell you what, the other thing is, I mean, this is just as an event producer, we're getting a lot of COVID questions. Of course. Are you going to even have the event? What's going, what's yeah. your, you know. And that's what, all going to change, but. Um, I hope so. But anyways, the bit, the business model aspect is, so if you think about yeah. going back to our conversation, what, what value are going, you're going to deliver? Do you have that audience first? And then think about, then you can think about, all right, well, social tokens or NFTs, what makes sense? and create that educational process. So if this is something that you wanna do right now as part of your content marketing programs, your emails, your YouTubes, you need to have something to educate your customers about cryptocurrency, about NFTs, about whatever it is, about decentralized so what did you finance, do? So, they, so, so they're so, educated enough because when yeah. you do this, you're gonna to get to a point and say, oh man, I should have just done a credit card because nobody has a wallet. So what, what, 
what did you do or are you planning to do based on what you've learned so every, others can learn from, you know, because you've still got 75% yeah. of this to go? Yep. Yeah. So, um, and thanks to people like you've had a lot of wonderful feedback. So right now we're trying to show the value of the different um, exclusive NFTs a little bit more. So we're doing that as we get closer to the event and announce speakers and things like that, that will help. If I had a do over, I would, I would probably make the levels lower to, I would probably create it instead of a hundred tickets. I'd have probably created 200 or 250 tickets, but lower at a price. much lower price. Yeah. Probably like 0 0.2, 0 0.25 ETH, something uh. like that. And maybe yeah. you would have allowed more than one ticket to be sold also? Yeah, or would, I would have yeah. absolutely done that. I would not have made it exclusive because I actually thought, because, I mean, we've got, see, this is the discrepancy between what happens with social tokens, such a different technology than right. NFTs. We have 1,600 holders right. of our social token, but most of those people have never purchased an NFT. Right. So if you think about the way, like if you're getting in and figuring out, okay, how do I get my audience involved? It goes, so I would have more people, less price, Get it on the secondary market. And to your point, this is a smart contract that you can set up. So we set it up. Our social, our smart contract says 5% royalties. I see. In which I like that number. I think 10% is too high. I so like to royalties on trades where if someone sells it to someone else, you get it. You get a exactly. percentage of that. So if you're an open C and you yep. put your, let's say you've got a CEX never ending ticket, you put yours for sale and you sell it, whatever, we would get back a 5% kicker off the royalty sale sale of that. I would have done what Gary Vee did and had that and just had a lot of churn because what will happen is we're not there yet, but when the, uh, let's say we have an amazing celebrity that we announce, well, the, the backstage passes will be worth way more than a regular VIP ticket. Right. But we've got to mint those first, get them on OpenSea so people can see the rarity because there's lots of rarities, but we're not there through the initial part of the process, so. That's what else did you learn and what other wisdom can you share with our audience that's thinking about maybe creating some sort of an access based NFT? Um, I would create some community. I'm not a huge fan of telegram, but discord. I absolutely love. I would create a discord community just around your project. Now, if you already have a discord community and you want to add a, you know, one category about your, uh, your NFT project, that's fine. But the ones that are successful, as you know, they have a whole community because you have so many questions just about that thing. And if you do that well, it's very easy to get people to say, oh, come to my Discord, come on in, come in and learn about this. And then you get that movement going. Like I'm a big fan of what Crypto Dads did because they did that really well. I think they had something like 25 or 30,000 people already in the Discord before they launched their you know 10,000 NFT project, which is, by the way, I, if you get it, if you get a chance and you want to see a really good business model for people listening, the Crypto Dads NFT project is a really good one because they have a long-term roadmap. That's oh great, we're going to launch a Crypto Dad. Crypto Dad owners get a Crypto Mom, and then you get royal if they use any of those things in their upcoming shows or upcoming games that they're going to have on the roadmap. You get compensated for those if you own that particular NFT. So it's a lot of fun things that they're doing with their community. They have poker tournaments. They have all kinds of things. So. I probably, to that point, Mike, I probably would have created a longer term roadmap even outside of the event. So what do you get all year long? Do you, is this just with the event? Because right now we have an event that hasn't even existed yet. I would love to see, well, what are we doing in February? What are we doing in March and April? And I think that's what we're actually going to add and change, Mike, because I want to see this community because we have the Discord set up for the VIPs. I want to create something where there's a hundred people that really feel like they're getting something special. So we're working on that right now. And we'll have that in a probably 30 days where you'll see, okay, this is not just an event. These people will really get a lot of other things of value. So my recommendation would be think about the value. And is it enough value are you giving up? And then think about the long-term roadmap. And when you put that roadmap together, I would work it. I know it always changes. We know roadmaps change, but I'd go out 18 months and I'd do it visually because the ones that I see doing it best really have some kind of a, a visual infographic that say, here's the year and here's all the things that we're dropping every month. And then that keeps the community going as well. And you share all that news on your Discord server. 
I purchased uh, Tom Bilyeu's, um legendary key. I don't know if you're familiar I with this. I, I do theory. have one, absolutely. Yeah, and um, you know, at first I didn't understand it, but then I began to understand the long-term vision. And I think that's the key for these projects moving forward is I think we're moving from an era of just NFT as art to NFT as experience, right? And that's what I think is kind of exciting because you look at, you look at, your project, what you're trying to do, right? Which is the hope that you're going to keep having these yep. events uh, and someone can do the math and say, okay, those events are only going to get more expensive and I'm going to always have this special access. In his case, there's all sorts of crazy stuff that comes depending on what kind of level of key holder you are. Yep. Did you have something you wanted to add to that or no? No, no, no. I, I yeah. actually, Tom Bilio's case study is a great one to look at. And he has an amazing visual roadmap yeah. that I would absolutely go to. I mean, the one thing that I thought that Gary V did wrong with V friends is that he limited his event to just three years. I'm like, ah, it doesn't feel right because what happens when you get to 2024? Does it just fizzle out? Well, obviously Gary's a smart man. He already knows the roadmap before beyond 24. He just hasn't told us yet. So get away from the idea that this is a cash grab. And this is what I should have learned. And I did learn from social tokens. If I would have said, Okay, how did the first month go for social tokens? I would have been, it's, it would have been horrible, Mike. It would have been like, oh, this is, didn't work at all. The price didn't go up. I've got no holders. Well, once you get through the first two, three, four, five months, it's just like content creation and building an audience. It takes time. So if you do this well, the long-term aspect of you creating something with your audience, with your community, that 102 fans we talked about is going to be tremendous. So you probably have to say, I'm not going to be too critical. And this is what I have to tell myself. I'm not going to be too critical of the first six months because this is a long-term commitment I have. This is a forever commitment I have with my audience and they're leaning on me for trust. I mean, I have to, they have to take it at you know my, my word that we're going to do all these things going forward. I mean, they have the NFT, they have the contract, but more than that, they're believing in me. They're believing in Brian Clark. They're believing in this event. So we have to go ahead and do that over and over and over again and remind them on going through content and information that this thing is going to be worth their time. You and I are both events people. And, um, you know, there is this jump from, okay, I own the NFT. How in the world do you actually logistically handle the access into the event? Knowing you yep. can trade the NFTs and stuff like, I'm sure this is something you're struggling with. And maybe you come up with a solution because, yeah, again, at a macro level, if these things are tradable, which they are. Um, how are you going to manage, you know, the moment someone shows up at the door? Talk to us about that yeah, a little bit. Yeah, so this was a really interesting discussion, Mike, because I'm like, okay, how is this going to happen? Because if somebody buys Mints an NFT, a never-ending ticket, and then they go, okay, they're registered for the event. That's great. But then if they sell it on OpenSea, well, what happens? So I was trying to figure out the best way to do it. So we have a little bit of a manual process. So if you go ahead and you mint your ticket on the mint.cex.events site, that's great. You have that and you can go ahead and register for the event. And you go basically go through a traditional registration process. You go ahead and set that. It's linked to your uh, your key. So it's always you. Great. Done. But here's the thing. If you go ahead and sell that on OpenSea, we've got notification. It wipes out your registration. <laughs> so you're not registered for the event anymore. So if you go ahead and you sold your ticket, let's say, Mike, you're coming to the event, you registered. If you sold your ticket a week before, your registration to the event would be done. Cause it, it, so how in the world did you logistically make that work though? Because it sounds like what you had to do was you had to create some sort of um, backend system that yep. checked to make sure that the ticket is still owned by the person, right? That's like, right. Yeah. It's a total backend system and I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a tech person, but we worked with a wonderful local group here in Cleveland called fandom. Uh, they also do glory smacks in the kickboxing area. So if you want to see, see some of the stuff that they do and, and that's what I asked them, I'm like, how do you do that? So they have a little bitty database set up. So when people register, it goes to that database, it talks to our official database for the event and then whatever sells on it OpenSea, tracks it and then it happens it, and then and we get the notification. You can see these things happen in ether scan, but if somebody sells, if you sell yours on OpenSea, it goes ahead and pings that database. And basically it's just, it's like an Excel database. It just flattens out that line and we get a notification to say, oh, there's been a transaction. That registration is no longer good. But here's the other thing that Where I it gets like. tricky though, is how are you going to know who owns it, right? Because like, like normally when you mint it, right after you mint it, you're given the chance to go ahead and fill out a form to put your name and, yep. and stuff in there. But when you trade it, that's going to get a little tricky, right? That's right. When you trade it, you have to go back to that mint site because that mint site is your home to register. So if right. you went and bought it on the secondary market, you'd have to go back to the 
the CEX site and go ahead and register for that event. But right. the other thing that I do like, so this is interesting. So let's say you bought a ticket, Mike, and for whatever reason, you can't go in 22, but you still have the ticket. I mean, this is your, well, you can then register somebody else. You can register anybody you want because you know what? You own the ticket. I love that. I love that because oh, that's you don't have cool. to worry about anything. So, so you, you can essentially, if you will, lease out your ticket that year to somebody else. That's, that's right. Kind, so that's here's the, cool. here's where it could get crazy. And I, I hope some of this stuff happens because I want to tell you about it. Let's say that we go ahead and, you know, God willing, we sell out 500 tickets. It's done. There's no more tickets available. Well, the only tickets that are remaining are these VIP tickets. Right. If somebody can't go, they could then resell they're just not the ticket itself. I own the out, token. Yeah, I own the, the token, but I'm selling the right to get into the event. Exactly. That's kind of so cool. these are things that these are things that we I mean, I've been in events for 20 years, Mike. These are things that never came up. We never had these yeah. situations, but now we are. Huh. So um crazy. <laughs> what about the marketing side of it? Talk to us a little bit because obviously you know, on your sales page, are you pr promoting the never ending ticket or for the event, or are you just promoting the event and you're doing a special promotion for this never ending ticket? Cause again, like you're selling a traditional event, you can buy with visa, MasterCard, American express, or the tilt coin, presumably. Right. But then you've got this never ending ticket component. How are you positioning all that together? Yeah, so the, the event marketing has an event marketing uh, timetable. There's no NFT, NET marketing in any of that right now. All we're doing is we're focusing on the event. We're set, selling sponsorships, doing all those things and getting to a sellout. The NETs, I would say, are The never-ending tickets. Never-ending yeah. tickets. I'm sorry, I call them NETs. Yeah. They're, they're just for, right now, our super fans. So- I have two things that are going on for that. I'm still talking to super fans because honestly, I, if I work with in some of these super fans, some of the people on our discord group individually, I'll start, I'll get these things sold. It's just working with each one. It just takes time to sell individually to get somebody up and running with, uh, with MetaMask because they would sell, they would sell it with credit card or they would buy with credit card, but I don't want to go there yet, Mike. Right. I, I want to, I want to educate the audience and, and have them go there. Um, the other thing that we are doing is I'm working right now, I'm working with a couple of um, crypto podcasts to promote just the never ending tickets, just that por portion of it, because there's an opportunity here to get in some new people that aren't our audience to become aware of the event. So I think there's a, there's a way to, to get involved in a new community that's not necessarily our super fans. So we'll see how that goes. But again, we're marketing the event completely separately from the way that we market the, the NFTs. Fascinating. Um, I want you to look into the future a little bit and want, I want you to imagine where this is all going with NF, the concept of NFTs for access. Like, where do you see this going in the next few years? I don't know right now if we're in a bubble or not, um, but it seems like when we start seeing all these corporations pile on with this NFT stuff, I saw um, Bud Light get into something recently and I'm like, okay, here we go. It's getting interesting. But the fact is, is that, and I've said, I said this a year ago when I first learned about NFTs, I think that every ticketing process to every major sports game in the United States will have some NFT component in two years. And I will stand by that prediction. So if that's the case, think of all the other ticketing and all the other access and all the other membership programs and loyalty programs you have. Are they going to go with an NFT model or a token model because their user, their customer can get a little bit more access, a little bit more ownership, feel a little bit better because it's a digitally scarce good? I think the answer is yes. So I think you're going to see more and more of this happen. Corporations are jumping on faster than I thought they would. But again, we don't have to go and we won't. I don't think we'll ever go completely decentralized. I don't think anybody wants that. Some people want that, but we only need the hope, the choice that our customers want a little bit more and they want to create something with us. And that's why I love Web3. And you can have, there's people out there talking about, oh, NFTs, it's a fad and you can do, you know, it's just a JPEG and right click and all that other stuff. But I think that they've never, when I say they, audience members have never had an opportunity or a choice to have something more than just entertainment or learning. We're giving them something more than they've never had before. And I think more, as more corporations find out about this, as more audience members, they're going to look. And I think that if you had to make a choice and say, oh, I'm, should I go and be part of this community and 
put a little bit up front to make this something amazing for my life, they'll go with that option and the token makes that possible. So what do I think the future is going to be? I believe that we are as human beings in the next five plus years are going to spend way more time in whatever this metaverse thing is, which I hate that name uh, because Facebook took it over, but that's another story. I think that we're going to be spending more time there. If we're going to be spending more time there and we have digital goods, how are those digital goods represented? They're represented with a token, with a non-fungible token. Everything's unique. Everything's independent. You're going to have NFTs all over the place for everything that you do. And now we're just seeing the adoption process. Just like you saw the adoption of the mobile phone, the adoption of Facebook and Instagram, you're going to see the adoption of a digital wallet, whether it's MetaMask or wherever it is. We're all going to have one. It's going to get easier. That's, I just can't wait for that day where it becomes easy for somebody to sign up, where we don't feel like, oh, we're going to make a mistake and lose it all. We're going to get more comfortable with whatever this technology and this process is. And we are going to have a lot of value and a lot of things digitally that we, you know, we never thought was going to be possible. So I think that's probably five years out. And at the same time, Mike, you're going to have people that don't do it. That that are and that's fine. That's fine. We're, it's just going to well, take. And, it's just going to take time. My goal, my look. I didn't understand V Friends. I had a chance to buy V Friends. I had a chance to buy it. I didn't get it. And I, I have a mantra, which is, I don't do things if I don't understand them. And the same thing with social tokens. I had a chance. I said no. I was part of the early initial crew of 60 people that they wanted to recruit. And I said, no, um, I want this show to be that inspiration for somebody out there to go do their version of the never ending ticket or whatever they choose to do, because I want the business world to understand the opportunity because we together, you and I and everyone else who's listening have an opportunity to actually change things in a pretty yeah. powerful way. And you have a chance to be early. And the more you listen to people like Joe, and the more you begin to wrap your head around this stuff, the more your eyes will be opened. Now, Joe, if people want to check out your never ending ticket, first of all, where do you send them? Yeah, um, ce uh, mint.cex.events, the event site okay. is cex.events. If you want now, to check out everything we're doing there. And if people yeah. want to reach out to you, uh, where's the best place you want to send them? Best, best place is I'm at Joe Polizzi, P-U-L-I-Z-Z-I, -Z -Z everywhere on the web, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. And then the main site is the tilt.com. And that's where our, where our newsletter is. And the, I, it's just to, to give a closing word, because I, I forgot to say this before, Mike, don't get stuck in the technology. Don't get stuck in the terms. Focus on the idea that this is ownership and co-creation with your audience. And by the way, in five years, we might not even call it NFTs. But the token makes this possible. So think to Mike's point, think about the business case, think about your customers, and the technology will work itself out. Just right now, we're in experimentation mode, and there's you will be you will benefit by experimenting early. And I guess that's what I would say. It's okay to fail early here. It's okay to learn some things. I've learned a ton. I would have never learned all this stuff if I didn't go ahead and try it. And the next time we do a project, we'll be ready for for some of these things and we'll do it better. Thank you, Joe Polizzi, for coming on today and sharing all your insights with us. We're better because of it. Thank you, and congratulations on the new podcast.